so yeah welcome everybody welcome to the launch of brightwork i've got a copy just behind me and i'll probably um, show it a bit closer in just a minute um, we've got uh, ellen reese and susanna v evans with us and we've got the chat room open if you want to send questions or you can send them privately directly to myself or to sarah and we'll pick them up right at the end uh, so first up this evening we have eleanor reese um, eleanor is a former eric gregory award-winning poet with a number of pamphlets and collections to her name, including uh, Andraste's Hair, which was shortlisted for the Forward Prize for Best First Collection, and the Well at Winter Solstice, which received a Northern Writers Award. Um, other titles include Blood Child, Riverine, and Eliza and the Bear. And we're really especially um, excited to be welcoming Eleanor to Guillemot this evening because we'll be publishing her fifth collection next year. So I will hand you over to Eleanor now and just uh, just welcome you, Eleanor, to Guillemot Press. It's lovely to have you here with us. Uh, Eleanor, over to you. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Luke. I am so pleased to be here this evening. Um, I'm so pleased to be working with Guillemot Press um, and to be here to celebrate the launch of um, Susanna's beautiful pamphlet, Bright Works. So thank you. Um, I'm going to be uh, reading a selection of poems which are all brand new, um, they've not been read before, um, and they will hopefully find their way into the collection next year. Um, I'm going to begin with a long poem because I like long poems, um, and this was a poem that actually I wrote back in, in January 2020, and I say that um, because the date seems really significant and hopefully that will make sense when I read the poem. So I've got two pre-pandemic pre poems, if you like, and the rest of them are from this, from the more recent times. I'm also going to be reading off a piece of paper. So. Portent in the High Woods. The men sit before the hearth, spit words into flames. Something is coming over the mountains, along forest tracks and past the stream. They know this as he saw it in a dream, heard horses' hooves stick in sandy mud, saw in his sleep a shadow in the high wood, long lined like a tree, but swerving down the path like a torrent. He says this out loud. Men lean inwards, look east across lead-lined windows, terraced gardens, sodden topiary, to feathery fog, the flood. And in the woods, at a fire pit in the grove, twigs are laid on the centre stone. A mist swirls and scatters as oaks creak and crack. Cloudy droplets skulk like rain clouds over the earth. At their hearth, the men cackle, scramble for spears and swords. Across mountains, in the estuary, thick tide is far and out. Lithe winds ride in over the valley. One man licks his lips to taste the salt. In the grove, weary bodies rest on the sound of the mist, which crunches now like the rock that it is or was before it came to be lost here at the tip of the sky. And the stone underneath their bones rustles, glitters, sand shifts apart granite, then particles smack on particles, eroding pleasurably into strata. Muscles ache as they dream, Bone on sinew, clench and pull. Scratch at nerve endings, stretch out ligaments. Worn down, they sleep. The men creep beneath the trees, torches held high under drips from the moss. At the end of the path, a pants like a dog, a sea wind, then fog hung in the old oak grove as, like foxes from a hole, they reach the fire pit, poke it till it burns, bold and mist-born breath, 
shine bright like constellations. And there are no bodies sleeping, only piles of sticks and stones, laying in the shape of a human, lost in the twine of time and rot. When morning comes, the men sit at the embers of the fire. In the ash, a drawing of a body of a man. In their eyes, silence, like they never began to chase away the salted air, blown over the valley from the lips of the sea. A different power flows through us. A curlew cry on a newly wetted beach. A spoken song, words born of mist, not ink. So I'm now going to read um, a couple of shorter poems. Uh, this one also written um, uh, at the same, same place as that previous poem. The first draft of that was written out on the edge of the Wirral Peninsula at a place called the Red Rocks, which is right on the edge of England looking over to Wales. Um, so this poem is called Escape at Red Rocks. I am the colour of the outside, a stillness moving like a winter tide, a new shoreline in formation, a marshland waterlogged, soggy ground needs time to dry it out. But time as sea wind, not calendar, the time found inside spaces stretching out and over like skin on a drum is a resonance. A wave that submerges the entire rock, not chiseling or scratching at one area only. Not just a mind to impress upon, but a flattened and silken self, all bound into the support of the water. Head rising up and down to find my breath. So the rest of these poems were written following um, the first lockdown and I've spent a lot of time walking locally in the parks as I'm sure everybody has. Um, so they are very site specific, um, but perhaps not um, out of choice. Um, but this one um, is more recent actually, but um, I've I'm not reading them chronologically now. So uh, this is Tamlin of the Winter Park. You walk ahead of me, beckoning, disappearing. You open the side of a tree, step through bark to another park, which is a series of rooms laid out on leaf mulch. And on a sofa near a sycamore, you lean on upholstery, smiling, gesturing, opening your arms. Then turn your back as I step into the glade. Muscular branches lean and block my way. As I stop to see you, still grinning, still watching, asking, oh, how will you get in? A chimney puffs, bricks are built with grey. I peer in while you stare through a shining window. Come in, you say, come in. But when I place my palm on the handle, I push to air. And you are calling, not unkindly, oh, do come in. As I search in the leaves for a key to solidify walls, to make the barrier more convincing. On coming in from the cold, I invoke a house on the edge of a hill by the sea, sure audible from the door as I take off my boots, a fire coils in the grate, my heart pumps blood to arteries which are livening. I hang a coat on a metal hook, outer layer burns to touch. And this life is more lived than others I have visited like losing itself into the stone of the walls. In a room I build by hand as night fades in, my interior the same texture as the dusk.
upturned earth. Down, down, rots leaf to beetle and fungi. The rusted iron railings that edge the park are coppery green reminders of definition. As cut clods lean up on an elbow, like a body in a bed, and raise a loamy face to my gaze, exhale a hilly breath, pick up handfuls of mulch, munch gravelly mouthfuls then as a dog barks in the beyond just past the parkland gates, lean over and settle back onto felty deep dug claggy cushions, seep under into spade cut humps and muck, as the allotments lie fallow, forgetting us. Peregrine. Falcons by the belfry slide across a square of blue between sandstone tower and spring green trees. Triangular wings fixed realities against currents supporting each journey over the twitchers' cameras. Below, feathers lie along the tarmac like the aftermath of a drunken party. And in the porch, a pigeon hunches to warm a nest behind a row of thin steel pins lining a notice board's dark wood rim. Posters invite attendance at the Easter services. And on a sandstone ledge, her mate perches, plump and grey, eyes me, nods. I walk in, light widening from gable windows. And like a field of roses in bloom viewed from a hill above the valley, pigeons line polished pews, each warm body sat close to another. At the altar, no cross, but more feathers and an egg on a silver platter. The gods of the sky call like a round of thunder and all the birds ascend, falcons to the sun and pigeons to the rafters as the day outside the window still does not blossom with rain. Going inside. I stream through the unopened window, rise like steam from the dark of the driveway, over unwatered plants in pots on the sill, to the corridor which leads to the gallery, cafe courtyard just visible in the moonlight. I stand back, my unbodied self against the wall, as someone moves near, a child perhaps, or indistinguishable from night air, it's the passing I feel, in front of me, then after. I desire to stay, to give way to the force in the shade, to hold this shape, to allow for the crossing. But, willfully, I turn my neck to set my eyes on the length of the passage as it recedes into the body of the house. And this is my final poem. Harbinger. She came alone. She is standing in the yard, watching the windows of your house. She wants you to see her and to know that she is passing. She is asking you to speak for life. No, she asks for nothing. She does not need to ask. Her black hair, a long dress, a weeping heavy linen. And she isn't crying, but watchful as the leaves fall and the tree marked for felling is sliced in two. What does she want of you? She passes you a bud from a rose, hot pink against mossy rotten wood. She holds a sparrow taken from a springtime nest, singing fiery songs. It is molten. The bird scalds your fingers as she pours it for you over a distance. So far and wide, it is an ocean between continents. But it is also a few steps across the gravel, 
to where you stand bedraggled, flown from rest to speak with the shadow. She whispers, do not forget me, then strides clear past your chilly body, carrying like a cliff top beacon, fire in her palms. Thank you very much, Eleanor. We've got digital applause heading your way, it looks like. That was really lovely. It's the first time I've, um, I've heard you read, well, for a long, long time, actually. We met first in, in Exeter very briefly, I think, um, when we were both studying at some point. Um, it's really lovely to hear you read. Thank you very much for coming this evening. That was, that was brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for listening. Um, so, we're gathered here today, this evening, to celebrate the launch of Susanna B. Evans's Bright Work sequence, which I have just behind me and Susanna's showing off now too, um, which I kind of feel I want to show both sides because it's kind of shiny on both sides, isn't it? Um, it's, uh, it, yeah, like I say, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolutely brilliant sequence written during Susanna's time as writer in residence at the Underfall Yard, um, which is a working boat yard in Bristol. Um, it's a really beautiful sequence and the second publication we've done with Susanna following that stunning debut, which was um, pretty much the same time last year, I think. I think maybe April last year was uh, Marine Objects or Some Language, which um, we published just as we were heading into lockdown, really, or soon after we headed into lockdown. Um, so it didn't get a proper launch until late in the year. So it's really nice to be doing a, a sort of, I know, yeah, doing a, a, a proper event on it this, this year for, for Bright Work. Since then, since the publication of Marine Objects, um, Susanna has won an Ivan Jurits Prize for work on Bright Work. Um, she's appeared in Karkinet's new poetry series and she's received an award from New Writing North. So it's been quite a, quite a year for Susanna, I think. Um, and we're really pleased to be working with her again and once again to have produced this uh, what I think is a really surprising and striking little book again. Um, last time we did it with these um, the sort of interlocking uh, double pamphlets, it's two pamphlets that were, were held together that were illustrated by Chloe Bonfield um, and they were then sort of sing a sewn along the spine, it was quite quite, quite a production. Um, this time we brought in another um, regular Guillemot collaborator uh, for the cover which is CF Sherratt, Charlie Sherratt, who is also based in Bristol and who produced this um, appropriately shiny and bright work. Um, so it's a beautiful book full of beautiful playful poetry and I can't wait to hear Susanna reading from it. Uh, so congratulations Susanna for another terrific book and over to you. Thank you so much <laughs> um, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, I'm delighted to be launching this pamphlet um, a huge thank you to Luke and Sarah for helping to bring it into being, um, to Charlie Sherratt as well for the beautiful cover illustrations. Um, and it's very lovely to be reading with Eleanor Reese as well, whose book I have here, and whose next book from Gillenwalt I'm looking forward to as well. So thank you um, everyone for being here tonight. Um, so as Luke said, the poems and bright work were written as part of a residency at Underfall Yard, which is a boat yard, working boat yard in Bristol. Um, so I'm also really grateful to everyone at Underfall Yard Trust and all the resident boat building businesses as well for their support um, while I was there working as a writer. Um, and a lot of the poems I wrote during this residency were about objects. So some of the objects were objects sort of Victorian machinery in the workshop at the yard. Other objects were very kind of quotidian, so crates and skips and things that were just kind of around. Um, and the poem I'm going to read first is a bit of a love poem to the slipway at Underfall Yard. Um, so I'm just going to show you a picture of the boat yard. Oh, I'm just gonna actually, I'm gonna do that again because there's a trick that I'm gonna, oh, that's good, okay. Okay, so there is the boatyard. You can all see the boatyard. Um, and this is the slipway. So this is a patent slip. Um, it sort of rolls out into the water and then it's hauled back in to um, bring boats back for repair. And this poem is called 
slipway. Your other names are less lovely to me. Boat ramp, launch, boat deployer. As the rain slips in, sluicing over silt and sawdust in the harbor, I think of slippages, how your name could slip to skidway or siltway or saltway or softway or tiltway. I've seen you slide into the water, lowering yourself with an easy song, a sweet whining, a slow clanking. I've seen your wooden posts sink deeper like fins. There are other lovely things about you, your timber cradle, how you hold the hulls of boats so closely, how you keep your chocking stable and whistle at the sight of a wooden deck. They call you a heave up slip, but the only heaving is done by the men around you who lower poles, wind winches, puff and glance up at the sky. You are serene, slipping into the water with the ease of a seal from a rock, moving your great body through the harbor, stretching like a spine, singing your sweet, sweet song. And we're going to move now into the woodshed at the boatyard. And uh, there might be people watching who recognize this face very intimately. Um, so while I was at the boatyard, I really fell in love with the language of boat building, how words that describe parts of boats also describe parts of the body. And um, also the names for the different materials used for building boats. And some of them you can see in this picture here. And this poem also contains the word bright work quite a lot. Uh, so I thought it would be a nice one to read for the launch of bright work. And it's called Say Elbow, Say Heart. Sprit sail, butt block, camber, centerboard, aligned ribs, apron, gaff rig sloop, breast hook. The boat builders balanced by curved pieces of timber, oak for the keel, pitch pine for hull planking, larch for masts and spars. They let language fall from their tongues, let it shape the movement of their hands. Chine construction, scantlings, sapwood, rollock, topside, capstan, Bowsprit, fender, jib, footwell. I say elbow, and they think of the curved piece of frame at the turn of the bilge. I say heart, and they picture the center of a section of timber. Pintle, peak up, planking, rabbit, rigging. Oaken, middle futtock, limber hole, lodging knee. The language is worked into the wood as they move, mahogany murmuring with the sound of canvas, carlins, clinker, combing, cradle, crook, taking on the shine of seam, scuppering in place of varnish, settling down into the hull of the yacht soothed by the words starboard, spiling batten. Shutter plank. Chocks away, heave up, nearly there, they call out in their sleep. Empty hands grasping rope. Lidded eyes imaging the sight of a red hull inching onto a slipway. And as the dream fades away and the sun eases up over the harbor, the words bright work, bright work, bright work lap at the corners of their rooms. <clears throat> so we're going to go up into the sky a little bit here. Um, and while I was at the boatyard, I became interested in how all these various ropes and pulleys and, and masts sort of made me think about the 
equipment that certain types of disability require. And so this poem is a sonnet and it attempts to sort of reimagine quite a difficult situation relating to disability in a new kind of marine context. And it's called Scantling. And it's a bit of a, a charm poem. When I next lift my mother in her hoist, into the air as if she's a heavy stone, I'll untremble my hands, turn her voiced cries of pain into the sound of waves blown back against the shore and conjure my secret boat building words, scantling, rope room, crab winch, watching her posture among the scaffolding. My mother is a climber up the mizzenmast, checking the trim of the boat, the lie of the land, the weather vanes, the forecast, and that sound, a seagull cry. Cradle, taffrail irons, spun yarn, ship's bell, around us moves the briny sea swell. So this next poem is about a very rusty object in the yard. Uh, this is a dredger paddle. It's used to clear silt in the floating harbour of Bristol. Um, and I was very, very, very pleased to see that the end pages of Bright Work are rust coloured. Um, <laughs> I appreciated that detail. So this is the dredger paddle. <clears throat> The BD6 dredger paddle is gently rusting, is gently resting by the powerhouse tower. Once a scraper of silt, a heavy jaw in the river, the dredger paddle is now a spotted masterpiece, exhibiting its many variations of rust freckles and salt teardrops. Its dots gather under the iron angles, darker and heavier at the top, turning from almost coal colour to russet, to orange, to the slightest suggestion of pale blue. Its temperature varies depending on the weather. It can scold or it can cool. Its teeth, meanwhile, rest harmlessly, siltlessly on the ground, while corrosion from the Latin corridere might mean gnaw through there is no more river gnawing, no more silt swallowing, only the slow turning of iron to mottled freckling, to rusted speckling. And after that, it's done and dusted, done and rusted. Um, this is another rusty poem. <laughs> it's sort of the twin poem to the dredger paddle. Um, and it is about, um, so it's a, a sluice paddle and it's a system, the sluice system that was designed in 1832 in Bristol and it's still in use in the floating harbour today and the purpose will come a little bit clearer in the poem. So this is a close up of the sluice paddle and sluice paddle number two. <clears throat> a sluice is a vertical gate that can be lifted to allow water through. While the dredger paddle is gently, lightly, softly rusting, so gently, so softly that it cries iron tears. The sluice paddle is actively rusting turning its iron skin to flakes and fragments, its silver sheen to russet. Installed in 1900, its face shows signs of age. It is pocked, lined, wrinkled, soft in places and scabbed in others. On duty constantly until 1994, it is now retired, found with a fracture on the 5th of October, 1994, following the high flows and silver poolings of a stopgate tide. 
His cousin Pavel, the number one, was fractured just a few months earlier. While active, the sluice paddle did two things. It kept the harbour water in and the tide out. The sea, with its silver fingers, is always trying to open gates, undo padlocks, sidle in. Sluice paddle number three, however, out of sight, buried, covered by the hiss hush of running water in the sluice room, is responsible for the disposal of dredged silt. Number two, exposed to the air, carries on rusting, crumbling, corroding. Its circles of iron oxide resembling map formations. Its cracks like those in a painted canvas. Fine dustings of powder gather at the bottom of its reinforced sections, like words that have disintegrated and floated down to the silver gray core of the subconscious. And the next poem has no image because I think you should all shut your eyes. This was oh, written during a gig trip at night and a gig is a type of rowing boat. Um, and it, I went out with a women's team and I sat in the pilot seat. So I was a seagull. And uh, this poem is about the rhythm of that experience. So seagull and feel free to shut your eyes. I am a seagull, an insomniac seagull, lulled by the rock and pull, rock and pull of oar strokes in the dark. Oars dip in the dark and the rock and pull, pull and rock of the boat in the dark makes the water shudder. The water shudders at the rock and pull and pull and rock of the women who rock the boat with slim oars in the dark. Who throw back their heads with laughter in the lull between the rock and pull of the boat in the dark. I am a seagull catching their laughter in the lulls between rock and pull. Watching their laughter weave a space in the river and rocking to the rock of the boat in the dark. I'm just going to read two more poems. Um, this is a one sentence poem that some of you might have heard before. <laughs> and I'm gonna do the same trick, which is if you have any names for this part of the boat that I'm going to talk about, please do leave them in the chat and I would love to read them later. Um, so I became very interested na in naming things while I was at the boatyard. Um, and this is a part of a boat that I couldn't find a name for. And it's that sort of, crescent shaped absent space um, that you can see in front of you. Um, and because I couldn't find a name, I asked passers-by what they would call this space and made a poem with their suggestions. So it's something of a collaborative poem. And it's called Barnacle Oblong. <clears throat> Having been told by the boat builders that there is no name for the hollowed space between the keel and the rudder, for that oblong space that is like the body of a fish, the space that peeks out behind the white and aqua hull of the boat that Jasper saved, the little hilliard, the little nine meter hilliard named Puffin. Having been told that the space is for a propeller, but that there is no name for the space, I cast around and ask the boatyard strollers, the visiting tourists, the woman with pushchairs, the men with long cameras, the children with caps, what they might call that space, standing next to Wynne's Claire de Lune, that beautiful white boat with the peeling hull, the rusting rudder, and that unnamed space peering out behind. And they say, laughing at first, looking round. Rudder hole, prop gap, propeller housing, and Andy, who's here tonight, passing, says wiggle space, spin space, and Julie says prop shaft exit, sounding technical. 
And then serious men who pass say, propeller aperture, rudder gap. And one wonderful woman says, the void, and walks off silently. And I think, moon void. And a laughing man says, the no idea, the nautical gap. And another man says, it looks just like a bow, an archer's bow. And then words build and pour, boat crescent, hull crescent, the sea, the cake slice, rusted teardrop, interrupted moon, I think, as someone says moon, then moon cut, the reverse D, the knotty question, spare space, spin spot, Philip, knobber. And one woman who used to be an English teacher says, aerated vista. And one man scratching his head says, the hole and gap, like the space is a pub, a beloved space. And a passing French woman says, les Laurent, the word lilting out into the air. And the German girl pauses, thinks, says, das Hörnchen. And the man she's with says, backwing. And now the boatyard is alive with words taking wing. Media Luna, navigation alcove. Pickle moon, sickle moon, propeller crevice, core blimey, the D space, thrust capsule, half moon, and I think griddle, barnacle oblong. And I will just finish with a bit of a song. Um, I'm going to play the sound that the patents it makes when it um, kind of rolls down into the water. And then I will read a last poem that is sort of the culmination of some of the prose pieces I wrote, prose poems that I wrote at Under Four Yard. Um, and it's sort of a blueprint for the sound that the slipway makes when it, when it goes into the harbour. And I will try and recreate some of these sounds vocally. So don't be alarmed um, and you get to hear the actual slip play first. So I'll just play you a little bit of that now. Slipway song. No other patent slip can sing the same song. It begins high pitched. Siren notes let loose in silty air, all arching of vocal cords and sly sideways glancing. Soon it is underset by the rhythmic clanking of the not quite round wheels sledging down the rails. A sweet friction, an acoustic tumbling an unwinding clinking of slipway sound bits. A regular noise wind and sung over, the sound of grease and movement. <clears throat> and <laughs> ribbons its way into the harbor air and nails down the blackboard sound that curls itself into the ossicles of boat builders and passers by and nails down the blackboard sound, which is nonetheless not unpleasant, fragile, sing-song, closer in effect to a cat's purr, although without the deeper tamras. Clink, 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 ting, 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 a ding, ding, a ding, ding, and always accompanied by that rolling clank, redolent of the noise of bed springs and bedposts when they are at their happiest. Bed springs and bedposts, yes, but the sound could also be that of an orchestra tuning up. Violins tucked into shoulders, strings exposed to air and then to fine brushings of horsehair. The shiverings of sound overlap, braid together, form plaits and tresses, resonate against the, brick, the red brick walls, lie alongside the water and murmur over it only a moth wing's worth of distance between the sound ribbons and water ripples. The noises are louder, more irregular, 
as the boat is pulled up, more faltering, more questing, more waiting on the movements of boat builders as they tug and deliberate and squint and communicate. Their toings and froings are echoed by the slipway, absorbed into its woven fabric of silk song, the lift of its melody, its mechanical mutterings. At its lightest moments, the song can be felt in the word wishbone, the underwater contraption which holds the wire to the winch. The song is also in wire, in winch. Like the acoustic patterning of rain, this song is without monotony, not without delicacy. And at the moment of playing, the harbour is graced with double waves, as the boat's waves move in synchrony with the slipways sound waves. Thank you very much for listening tonight. Thank you very much, Susanna. There's lots and lots of comments coming in. Oh, that was that was amazing. I love there's lots of things I love there, but I also enjoyed some of the crossovers from previous readings. I loved your um that your starfish asterisk has developed as well. That you got some, um, and I think we've got some more suggestions for uh, for your barnacle oblong too along the way, which we'll come to in just a second. You mentioned the rust um, end papers. So I'm just so I'll show those. They're nice. They're these bright sparkly things on the inside of the of the book. There's actually something that me and Charlie spoke about quite a lot before we committed to it as well, because the the those um, the bright uh, sparkly um, Foiling, <clears throat> foiling on the front as well was all a part of that sort of connecting to the rust, which re repeats through the through the collection too. Um, so I'm talking while we're getting more and more comments in and questions in. And crikey, where to start here? So I'll start with I've written a couple of down from early on. That, um, got some really really good comments actually. Uh, in fact, I think one of the first ones was from Susanna on Eleanor, which was the the, the lights. Um, Widening from gable windows is beautiful. That was one of the early comments we got in. And um, Isabel Dixon, lovely Eleanor, those fallow allotments for getting us, thank you. Uh, Josephine Dickinson, love these Eleanor, a series of rooms laid out on leaf mulch, exquisite and fitting metaphor of your poetry, which has long been a favorite here. Um, I'll come back to Jeremy's question in just a second. Uh, Rebecca Sharp, gorgeous, magic coming through the screen. Um, fire in her palms, wow. Lovely, attentive, atmospheric poems, thank you, Ellie. Um, thank you for these textured passages from the inside to the outside and back again. Very lovely poems. Lots coming in. This is great. Um, <clears throat> uh, Susie Campbell, thank you so much. I enjoyed that very much, despite interruptions from a contrary cat. Um, James Goodman, wonderful. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, beautiful. Lovely to hear about the Wirral and that last poem, Eleanor, was so powerful from Sarah Claire Conlon. That was. Um, and great to hear you read from Annie Carr. I loved Peregrine and Escape at Red Rocks, also a lie in my interior, the same texture as the dusk. Um, lots and lots of lovely, lovely comments there. Um, I'm just, when we're getting into some comments to Susanna's, the languages worked into the wood as they move. Wonderful words and poems, Susanna, that's from Isabel Dixon. Um, then we get uh, Incredible from Jessica Rustin and Perfection from Cecile Barry. Uh, Nadira, that was gorgeous, pulled me into a trance. Uh, Josephine Dixon, new favourite poet, fantastic, and thanks for the screen shares. Um, Susanna is saying, I'm so enjoying this tour of the boatyard too. Uh, Scantling is so loving and beautiful. Um, uh, Cecile, I'm learning so many words and also missing the sea a lot. Um, Nadira, I need that to be read to, to me before bed each night, fantastic. I'm not sure which poem that was and Cecile agreeing with that. Uh, Michael Black, um, now we're coming to a couple of the words. We have Michael Black calling it half moon, Susanna calling it a rudder crescent, Annie calling it a rear view shark. Um, <laughs> and then more comments, overwhelmed at how good that was from Jessica, the heart of Orion from Josephine. And now the boatyard is alive with words taking wing, being emphasized by Jason. Perhaps one of my favorite lines from you, these poems are magnificent, of course. Um, Penny, fabulous set of poems. I know Bristol as my daughter lives there, but now see the boatyards with new eyes. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's lots and lots of comments. I'm gonna, I'll save these and I'll send them to you so you can see the latest because there's lots and lots. If you've got questions, please keep them coming. I'm gonna go back to right to the top to 
uh, Jeremy's first one, which was to Eleanor, which was, um, it was about the first poem in your sequence, Eleanor, which is, did, did you have a particular group of men in a particular time in the past in your first poem? Uh, it struck me they could be whoever I wanted them to be, nomadic hunter-gatherers, Norse folk druids, oak grove and fire pit, Celtic wanderers. Um, yeah, Jeremy's wondering if you had a specific group in mind on that one. Um, thanks, yeah, that is a very good question. Um, I suppose I didn't have a specific group of men in mind. I suppose I wanted them to perhaps figure for all of those different uh, possibilities that you suggested, but um, there, there is a context in that I, I wrote those poems after visiting Gwydir Castle, which is um, actually a, a, a house over in North Wales. And um, it was quite an, I didn't know this when I, I went there, it was quite a uh, fascinating place and that was um, very much connected with the Renaissance in Wales and um, used to host bards. And um, I've been reading a, lo a lot around the sort of transition from kind of ideas of humanism into our kind of more post-humanist kind of world. So I suppose I was, I was sort of thinking about that. Um, there, there was, there's another poem that I wrote first that's much more um, descriptive of, I'm just fascinated by these groups of men sat reading poems to each other and listening to each other and the kind of knowledge that they were exchanging. Thank you. I'll go to uh, the next one for Susanna, which is a recent one from Jessica which was, um, thank you so much, Susanna. I couldn't get over your use of sound in your poetry. Um, the last poem was so musical too. I'd love to know if you set out purposefully to write prose or lyrical or if it's just a natural instinct. That is a good question. <laughs> um, I think I've always been quite interested in prose poetry. So some of it, it, it is, it did feel like quite a deliberate decision to write lyrical prose poetry and to, to think of it very much as prose poetry rather than prose. And I think part of that, as, as you all know, Jess, is um, related to the French history of the prose poem. So, I mean, um, I was thinking a little bit of Baudelaire's prose poems, and he talks about sort of giving a different rhythm to prose. So there is something that, this idea that there's something sort of inherently poetic about it. But I suppose more to the front of my mind was Francis Ponge, whose prose poems are just fascinating. Um, he pays a lot of attention to things that don't get a lot of attention always. And what I love about his prose poems is that they're very kind of considered and quite objective and he sort of plays with that distance. But also I think, I think he, he really liked fables as well. And so often there's a sort of little like at the end of the poem. So I sort of experimented with that a little bit. Um, and I, I translated some of his poems, but sort of in quite a loose way. So they were more versions than, than straight, strict, very faithful translations. Um, so I'd say I definitely did set out to kind of deliberately write something that was both prosy and lyrical at the same time. Um, it, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, another one from for you, Susanna, from Phoebe, uh, who's asked, can you tell us how, so it starts with wonderful work, Susanna, can you tell us how you came to write at the boatyard? Yes. Um, <laughs> so I knew that I wanted to spend a period of time just writing somewhere, and I'd been on the hunt for somewhere to do this at, um, and I wanted somewhere that would, that I would feel very at home in and that would inspire me kind of constantly. And I thought of museums and galleries first. I'm very attracted to sort of um, the visual as well as sound. Um, and some of my poetry is quite descriptive as well. So I think that suits kind of ekphrastic poetry. But uh, one time I went for a run, which I don't do very often, but I ran through the boatyard and I just, there was something, I mean, and I don't want to say it's just about the aesthetics because it's much more than that, but there was also something very visual about it as well, about the textures and about the colors and about the water and about the way people use the space as well. I think it's, it's a bit confusing sometimes because you walk through and you're like, oh, 
should I be here? If there are people working, I don't quite know. Um, and it's a bit mysterious at the set. So I think it's that balance of sort of the, the working nature of it and also feeling a bit like, should, should you be here? <laughs> but then also as a poet in residence, sort of really getting to embrace the fact that I could be there. Um, and so I think that that was how it came about. I just sort of walked through it and really well, ran through it and um, really fell in love with it and felt that it was somewhere that I could write a lot about, I suppose. And I did, I, I wrote a lot of things when I was there. And so it, it's sort of that instinct that it was a good place kind of paid off. Just as you were talking, I was looking at some of the comments that came soon after that, which were quite fun. <laughs> As Elsbieta saying, thank you, Susanna. I thoroughly enjoyed all the slippages, names, triple modifiers, sounds. Then Michael Black saying, Francis Ponge is the best poet of soap. Yep. And Joan, <laughs> Joan Passy saying, Susanna, we must run away to Cornwall and talk about dockyards forever. <laughs> um, Eleanor, I had a, a private one come in for you as well, which was um, related to lockdown, how, about how you found writing in lockdown, because you, you added a couple of poems there. I know some people have found, have really struggled and some people have, have you know, found it uh, uh, really energizing in a weird way um, to be able to concentrate on the work. How did you find it? I think both of those things. I found it really difficult, but very necessary. So I think it was my coping st strategy um, was to have drafts to work on. Because obviously I've been teaching online like many of us um, and, yeah, and, and also also sort of trying without underestimating this, you know, the kind of impact of what was going on, but trying to see how it, trying to be aware of how it was no changing my perceptions and seeing if I could try and see if there was a shift in my um, sense of reality I suppose which is always fairly fluid um but um and but so but some so some of the many of these poems were written it in situ in 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 particular locations that I was found I was forming relationships with um so I was very interested about in the sort of dynamic relation that I was having with you know like a tree in the park or you know when I talk about a grove <laughs> remember I live in I live in central Liverpool or south Liverpool um my notion of a grove is is you know um imaginative version of a grove um so I was very interested in that like kind of could I continue to transform this environment that I know so well and the more familiar it became to me the more fascinating it became as an imaginative challenge to see if I could keep it changing and shifting and kind of and that for me was very necessary so I didn't feel as um well constricted I suppose yeah thank you um more questions coming in uh, for Susanna. How do you reconcile, this is from Joan Passy, how do you reconcile the natural watery space with the mechanical industrial space of the yard? And how do you conceive of that relationship in your work? That is such a tricky question. <laughs> um, I don't know, I don't know how to answer that. Um, you're right, I mean, they are such different things with different vibes. Um, the sort of really fluid watery rhythms and then the kind of I, I suppose it is a bit to do with rhythm maybe sort of the rhythm of work coming alongside um the rhythm of water although those rhythms are quite different but I think so in poems like Seagull for example I actually recorded um the sound and then I came back and I wrote a poem to the sound so I think there's something about the the sound of, and that's a kind of a rhythm of work, I suppose, a rhythm of pulling an oar back and forth. Um, but it's also, so it's a kind of, it's a bodily thing, but it's also slightly a watery thing. It's not very industrial. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't really know. I don't really know what else to say apart from that. Um, but I think it's a really good question. And I will have, I'll have more of a ponder. <laughs> All right, another tricky one for you then, Susanna. Uh, <laughs> uh, from Ko, does multilingualism inform your fascination with the names for things? Thinking of the poem Slipway, I was struck by the linguistic slippages you revel in. 
how they invoke the slippage between languages and even accents? That's also an amazing question. Um, yes, I think it. I think it does. I think. I think there is something about, and for me, the multilingualism. It's very much. I mean, French is my sort of other main language, and I speak some German as well. And I think I do play with those a bit sometimes in poems. And um, there's a bit of French and German in Barnacle Oblong, but that was purely coincidental because French and German people happen to walk by and talk to me. Um, I think it's some, something that I quite like to play on in translation as well. Like I quite like to rhyme words from different languages together, um, which is something that a few of the French poets that I am interested in sometimes do as well. I like to kind of have the ghost of another language in a poem that's in English. Um, and I think definitely, yeah, the slippages, I mean, partly that's just a fascination with English, I suppose, as well, and just made up words and made up languages. Um, because I think with very specialised languages, sort of, and I say specialised languages in the sense of like a, the boat building language, um, it can feel like an entire sort of different language to someone who's not uh, in key with that. So I think there is, there's definitely, I definitely have a fascination for sort of how all of those different things play off each other, whether it's uh, languages from other countries or languages from different types of work or thinking. Um, and I suppose they're always slipping together in my head, if not the poems. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think we've got one more. Um, which is right towards the end, Laura. Um, question to Susanna, how do you feel, actually there's one for both of you actually, which I'll come back to, but I'll do this one first. How do you feel bright work has built on or moved away from the poetry you wrote in some language, stroke marine objects? Are they continuous or is there a shift in your mind? Mm. Interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I think in some ways they're quite continuous because they're, they're all quite sort of sound orientated and they're all quite sort of concerned with water. Um, sound sometimes almost to the point of not nonsense, but I think sound is something that is both the meaning and slightly apart from the meaning. So I'd say that's something that I continue to be interested in. Um, uh, was there another part of the question that I, was that? Yeah, and mo moving away from it, I suppose, I suppose I did become quite interested in prose poems more, and that was something that sort of academically I was thinking about as well. Um, I am just quite fascinated by what a prose poem is and how you might define that, and also just sort of cross genre things. So one of my favorite texts ever, which I've mentioned in lots of different places before is, is David Jones's In Parenthesis. So David Jones was an Anglo-Welsh artist and writer. In Parenthesis was published in 1937. Um, and it uses different sorts of writing for different moments of tension, different sort of, and it has a lot of different rhythmical effects. And so I'm interested in that um, as well. And originally uh, Bright Work was, a 60 page poem. So that was sort of doing something quite different. Um, and then I scrapped most of it <laughs> and cut it down to, to what it is now. Um, but I'd say that sort of the, the sort of change from rhythmic, different rhythmic intensities is something that I'm still interested in and will be interested in in the future as well, I think. So the last question might be, um, it's going back a little bit. Um, and so with, we're celebrating the launch of Bright Work today and we've mentioned that we've got a book out with Eleanor next year. This question is, what are you working on next, both of you? <laughs> Should we start with um, Eleanor? Well, that's quite an easy answer. I'm working on the Guillemot manuscript. Um, I'm so excited to be working on that. Um, I think it's a wonderful press. I think it's wonderful what you're what you're achieving and and and, and doing with with the press. And um, yeah, I, I 
I don't know, I haven't said this to Sarah and Luke, but it's it's getting much longer. So um, I've recently I've recently just finished a commission as well for Liverpool's Light Night, which on the set, which was uh, recorded for BBC Merseyside um, in the park. <laughs> So there's a kind of recurrent theme here, but I suppose I'm testing myself against those limits of familiarity, I suppose, and seeing what what they produce in me and trying to work past that silence into something more meaningful, um, but not meaningful, obviously, in a way that I understand necessarily what that meaning is. Um, I don't think I'm in control of that, it, but that's that's the kind of process that I'm engaged in, I think, at the moment. So. I will keep going with that until it ends. Well, we're looking forward to seeing the new poems then. <laughs> uh, Susanna, what about you? Um, what am I working on? Um, one of the main things I'm working on at the moment, I suppose, is, is just my PhD thesis. <laughs> and sort of, I have lots of plans for what I want to do next. Um, but I, I am working on sort of two things. And I never really say, well, I, I feel like I'm, I'm quite a secretive writer. I like to sort of let it kind of gestate, I suppose, or like have a sort of a dark inward time. So I don't tend to really tell anyone what I'm working on until either it's done or I have to. <laughs> um, so I am, I am sort of, ideas are sort of blooming inwardly at the moment and I'm doing a little bit of writing, but I am also mainly trying to finish some projects that have to be finished before I can uh, spend too much time delving into the inward secret things. <laughs> PhD is a pretty good reason, isn't it? It's a pretty, pretty big thing to be working on too. Um, so I think that's, that's most of the questions there. Thank you for um, answering all of those. That was a little longer than I think uh, expected. It was a really, really lovely reading. Um, thank you both Eleanor and Susanna for those. It was really, really lovely to hear you both. Um, and we will call it a night there. Thank you everyone for coming. It was really good to see a lovely turnout and so many people who we've seen before um, and who come regularly. And yes, if we maybe now offer some digital applause and thanks to Susanna and Eleanor for, uh, for their wonderful works. Um, if you want to see um, more of bright work there's a couple of poems i know you've seen some of them today there are a couple of poems on the website which sarah just put the link up for it's only six pounds and it's an absolutely it's come out really really beautifully we're very happy with it um so yes i hope you all enjoy it and we'll see you at oh i haven't got the date in the top of my head we'll hopefully see a lot of you at the next reading which is the launch of philip lancaster's sonata with Norsh sabar reading alongside hopefully see you there thank you <laughs>